Hello, my name is Martin Quigley and I'm a teaching associate in the School of Psychology at the University of Nottingham. And today I'm going to talk about learning theory and conditioning. In particular, I'm going to look at classical conditioning, what it is and how it happens, operant or instrumental conditioning, where we'll look at how rewards and punishment can influence our behaviour, and finally, we'll conclude by looking at social learning theory, where we'll look at how the observation of others and how they learn can influence our learning. Now, to kick things off, we need to return to the work of a seminal physiologist by the name of Ivan Pavlov, who looked at the salivatory responses in dogs, and by that I mean the build-up of saliva in the dog's mouths. Now, what he noted, perhaps unsurprisingly, was that when he presented the dogs with food, which they desired, they would salivate in anticipation of eating this food. Much like how I may salivate if someone presented a cheesecake in front of me, I'd really desire this food, so I may produce a certain response to that. What he also observed, however, was that when he paired the delivery of the food with the presentation of what we'd refer to as a neutral stimulus, so perhaps the sound of a bell or a metronome, the dogs would start to salivate when the bell or the metronome was presented. So it appeared that they had learnt an association between the delivery of the food and the sounding of the bell. Now, at first this may seem like a relatively simple experiment. However, Pavlov observed this experiment and reported it using four key terms. And these key terms have incredible explanatory power, which enable us to explain a whole host of studies which have been performed with this particular procedure. Now, the four key terms which you need to be aware of are the unconditioned stimulus, which refers to a stimulus which is of biological significance. So in the case of the study by Pavlov, the food, the animal needs this food biologically. The other key term is the unconditioned response, which refers to the response which is provided when they're presented with the unconditioned stimulus. So in the case of the Pavlov study, this would be the salivation when the food is presented. And then the two final key terms are the conditioned stimulus, which refers to the neutral stimulus, so the bell or the metronome, and the conditioned response, which refers to the salivation to the bell or the metronome once they've learned that association. Now, since this initial demonstration, many thousands of studies have replicated this effect, and they've explained a lot of phenomena that we observe in the world around us. One particular study of importance was performed by researchers Watson and Rayner in 1920. And in this particular study, they sought to assess whether a fear response, whether a fearful response from someone could be conditioned to a particular stimulus. So, rather than looking at dogs, they looked at whether or not a fear response could be conditioned in humans. And in particular, they used a small baby, little Albert, who was approximately 11 months old at the time. And in this study, they first presented little baby Albert with a small white rat. And they wanted to see how he responded to this rat. Now, at first, he seemed relatively curious. He reached his hand out to touch the rat, and he seemed to smile and be absolutely fine with the rat being presented to him. However, in subsequent occasions when the rat was presented to him, a loud noise was also presented at the same time. A loud noise in the background behind baby Albert occurred at the same time. And what they observed was that after a number of pairings of this loud noise in the rat, Baby Albert also started to show fear to the rat. So again, we can see that he appears to have learnt an association between the rat and the loud noise. Now in this case, it was a relatively unpleasant association and he started to cry whenever the rat was presented subsequently. So this shows how perhaps phobias or fears can be conditioned. However, it's also the case that positive things can be conditioned. It's not just the case that fearful responses need to be conditioned. And this is certainly something which companies seek to take advantage of. And we see that often in the form of advertising and marketing. So often a company will want you to form an association between their product or their item and some positive idea that you hold. It may be the case that a company wants you to associate themselves with nice weather, luxurious items, clothing, um, lovely food, whatever that may be. And they do that by pairing their product, perhaps in an advert or a poster, with this pleasant thing. 
And this is another example of classical conditioning in the real world around us. So it's not just the case that it's fearful responses, it can also be positive responses, and it's not just the case that it's confined to animals in the forms of dogs, we also see this process in humans as well. So we've now seen how classical conditioning operates in a number of environments. At this point it's useful to return to those key terms and to try and apply those to some of the examples that we've looked at to really cement the understanding of these terms. So, if we have a little think about the Little Albert experiment that we discussed earlier, and we think about what the unconditioned stimulus is there, we may at first think, well, what could it be? We need it to be something which biologically has significance. In this Pavlov study, we had food. What was it in this particular experiment? Well, in this experiment, the unconditioned stimulus was the loud noise. It was the stimulus which frightened baby Albert and initially produced that response. Now that response that he produced, the crying, is the unconditioned response. We didn't need to train this association. This is something which happened naturally as a result of presenting the unconditioned stimulus. What was the conditioned stimulus in this case? The conditioned stimulus was the white rat. Initially, when baby Albert was presented with the white rat, he didn't demonstrate fear towards the rat. However, once this was paired with the loud noise, the unconditioned stimulus, he started to demonstrate fear towards the rat. And that fear that he demonstrates, in this case the form of crying, serves as the conditioned response. So in this particular case, we can see how these four terms can be mapped on to the different elements of the experiment. And they provide us with a very simple way, a very elegant way, of understanding how conditioning operates in this particular experiment. And we can also see this when we think about the advertising example that we used earlier. So in this particular case, the conditioned stimulus would be the company. The unconditioned stimulus would be the positive idea, something which naturally creates a happy thought in the majority of people, perhaps good weather or good food. And pairing those two things together, we hope an association will be formed. The unconditioned stimulus, as I said, would be something like the food or the positive idea. The unconditioned response would be the response that you have to that. Perhaps it makes you feel warm or happy. And they hope that response will also carry over to the conditioned stimulus so that when you're presented with the product or the company, you produce that conditioned response and you also feel happiness there. So we've looked at a few different examples of how classical conditioning can influence how associations are formed in both a positive and negative manner. And we've looked at some of the seminal studies which have been performed over the last hundred or so years. What's particularly important to bear in mind is the ubiquitous nature of this. And what I mean by that is that we see this in a diverse range of species. It's not just dogs and humans. We can also see it in honeybees, in rats, in pigeons, in fish, in all sorts of species. And as such, it seems to be something which has some sort of evolutionary advantage. It appears that it's beneficial to the organism to form associations between different events. And classical conditioning provides one way of doing that. Now, there are a number of factors which can influence this process, including how salient the certain stimuli are which are presented. Now, when I talk about salience, I refer to how much something stands out. So if I was to present you with a sound and it was very quiet, we'd say that this stimulus is of low salience. If I was to present you with a sound which was very loud, we'd say that this stimulus had high salience. So what we talk about is the intensity of the stimulus. How much attention does it grab of the organism or the person who's present? And it's not just confined to sounds, it could be the light, it could be that it's a bright light, it could be that it's a very low light, it could be that it's a shock or the amount of food which is presented, um, it could be that there's lots of food or very little food. So salience can apply to both the conditioned stimulus, the neutral stimulus, and to the unconditioned stimulus, the thing of biological significance. Now, to try and contextualise how the salience of a stimulus can influence learning, again, we can return to the study conducted by Pavlov. So, recall in the Pavlov study that the conditioned stimulus was the bell or metronome, so in essence, a sound. Now, if we had a sound which was very quiet, 
we'd anticipate that it would take quite a while for the dogs in that experiment to realise that this sound was paired with the particular food that they were anticipating. If they can barely detect the food, um, sorry, if they can barely detect the bell and they just don't know that it's there, it's going to take them a very long time to learn about it. If, however, the bell was very loud, so much so that they would sort of feel vibrations, there was such a loud bell there, we may anticipate that they would learn about that much quicker as a result of that. So we can see there how the salience of a conditioned stimulus could drastically influence the rate at which one learns the association there. Now, this also applies to the unconditioned stimulus as well. So, if we think about the unconditioned stimulus in the Pavlov study, it referred to the amount of food that the dog was provided with. Now, if they were presented with a very small amount of food, I mean a morsel of food, which was of not much interest and they could barely sense it or smell it, that it was there in the environment, again, we would anticipate that they would learn this association quite slowly. If, however, the food was very large amount and they could smell the food there, it was very easily detectable, we'd anticipate that they would learn this at a much quicker rate. So the salience of the stimuli can influence the extent to which classical conditioning, or rather the rate at which it occurs.